the so-called sweet science of boxing was often used as a sour metaphor by Hollywood for the darker side of light, and I don't think there's any better example of a movie with a boxing motif than Body and Soul. Uh, produced by Enterprise Studios, one of the first uh, independent studios of the post-World War II era in Hollywood, it features the renowned performance of the great John Garfield with a splendid cast of Lily Palmer, Anne Revere, Canada Lee, William Conrad, Lloyd Goff, Joe Pevney, who used to live in Palm Desert. I used to come down here early just to visit Joe. The ensemble of talent in this film, both in front of and behind the camera, is almost unprecedented. Uh, director Robert Rawson, the great screenwriter Abe Polanski, the director of photography James Wong Howe, Oscar-winning editor Robert Parrish, the assistant director was Robert Aldrich, for goodness sakes. Uh, Body and Soul was one for the ages. It also sadly proved to be a veritable casting call for the blacklist period, and we'll talk more about that. It's a lot to unpack, and to help me do that is tonight's special guest who will join me on stage, who's truly special. And if I had to read his entire resume, we'd be starting the film at 11 tonight. But very briefly, he is known for his roles as the gruff but tender prospector Ellsworth on HBO's hit western Deadwood, and the beloved demon hunter Bobby Singer on all 15 seasons of Supernatural. He currently stars as Defense Secretary Robert Singer on the hit Amazon show The Boys. He played Sheriff Selby Parlow in Justified and the gun dealer Lawson on Breaking Bad. He has additional credits. His movie credits include In Country, Grimson Peak, The Frontier. Uh, he was recently in Guillermo del Toro's Oscar-nominated Nightmare Alley, and the independent film Blind Fire, as well as Magnolia, Joyride, Sister Act, etc. He's also a internationally recognized playwright, the author of two books on film history, the former film critic of Films and Review, and I'm running out of breath. So welcome our special guest, the one and only Jim Beaver. You, you wrote this book on Garfield very early. Um, as an, as uh, an actor, this was back in your early days. Did you see him as an inspiration? How did, you, how did you view it? Why did you write a book about him? I wrote this book not right after I finished college, but during college. Um, it, it seemed much more interesting than my studies. Uh, <laughs> the truth is, uh, it was writing the book that I really became involved in Garfield's story. I had, I had picked the subject uh, for completely uninspiring reasons. Uh, uh, there were a lot of books coming out in those days, this, the, mm -hmm. the mid-70s, uh, about the careers of different actors, and I, I had dozens and dozens of them and I kept thinking I I could do this this is <laughs> I, th this is yeah. not the films out. of all those right, books the, yeah. all those films of books yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, and I thought well uh, how how's the best way to go about it and I picked about 10 actors that I really really liked and then I picked the one with the shortest career <laughs> <laughs> Jim, you've always been a practical man, I must say. <laughs> I've always been a lazy man. Yeah. But, uh, uh, but then I, uh, very quickly, as I began my research into Garfield's life and, and his work, uh, I got, I really got caught up in it. I had been a fan since I was uh, uh, a, a boy. In fact, the, the dedication in the book to my mother is because she introduced me to my first John Garfield film. She was, she was a big fan. The sense so, uh, of inspiration came later, mm -hmm. um, which is kind of the cart before the horse. But, you know, 50 years later, I, there are probably things I would do a lot differently with that book. But um, uh, I'm, I'm, the, the fact that uh, I, I wrote and published a book uh, while most of my classmates were 
just getting degrees and things uh, <laughs> uh, is, is, is a, a bit of a point of pride for me. Well, so. as it should be, I, I, I have to say that uh, uh, Garfield's daughter, Julie, who has been a guest here, God, I can't believe it, like 12 years ago, wherever it was where he ran all the way, she called me today and she said, you know, Jim Beaver wrote the best book about my father <laughs> and so forth. And, you know, she said, both you guys break legs tonight and uh -huh. it's great. And that, you know, that's her favorite movie of her dad's. And, um, and she always uses the word uh, metamorphosis mm -hmm. to describe what Garfield's character goes through as Charlie Davis. And... Garfield's life was a lot like Charlie Davis's life in the movie. Very uh, much so. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, and of course, this was based on the Barney Ross character. Yeah. And um, um, My understanding was that a book had come out about Barney Ross, and Garfield had optioned it right. and, uh, and tried to convince uh, studios to do it back as early as 45. Right. And, uh, uh, and then... When he broke away from Warner Brothers, uh, it was one of the first things that he wanted wanted to do. Although uh, uh, Barney Ross sort of objected to the notion of it being about him. And, yeah, well, he uh, was. He was uh, the, the Barney Ross story was he was very much like the character in the movie Rags to Riches from I think Brownsville and so forth, and was a great war hero in Guadalcanal and won the Silver Star and everything, but he was severely wounded, and uh, because of that, after he recovered, he became addicted to opiates and heroin. So I, I believe what happened is the owner of Enterprise was a guy named Einfeld who had knew, known Garfield when he worked at Warner Brothers, and then it was uh, Lowe's son and somebody else named Blumenthal. They, they got $10 million line of credit Bank of America to make movies, and they didn't want to make a movie about a boxer because, A, the bad publicity, because eventually Barney Ross turned himself in in those days the government had hospitals where you could kick the habit and if you went and you said I'm I'm a junkie I'm a drug addict they would not prosecute you take you in and he did that and and successfully kicked it and so forth but they said oh well no women are going to see a boxing movie so we'll leave lose half the audience and so between according to the editor of this Robert Parrish between Garfield Robert Rawson um, Bob Roberts and all that, he said, these were very, very intense guys. <laughs> and they basically told the suit, according to Ross, and said, you already built the sets, and I already signed a contract, so if you don't make the friggin' movie, I'll sue your ass. And that was, that was how the movie got made, essentially. Go on. Oh, no, 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 <laughs> this is about you. So the, 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 how, did you, how did you come, as you, your metamorphosis, your journey as an actor, after school there was the Marine Corps, no, and, no. Marine before Corps that, Marine Corps was school, well. Give yeah. us, give us the sequence of events there. Um, well, uh, uh, I, I was, a, I was a movie buff, uh, an intense movie buff, uh, starting in my early high school days, and uh, um, and even in high school, I thought I, I maybe want to write film history uh, mm -hmm. someday, uh, but then. Um, uh, I went into the Marines right after high school, and uh, uh, when I got back from Vietnam and uh, got out of the service, uh, I went to, uh, then I went to college, mm -hmm. and, uh, and this was the early 70s. There were, uh, uh, film history courses abound nowadays at, at colleges, but back then they didn't, and uh, so, uh, and I was going to school in Oklahoma. It was not a hotbed of cinematic study. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I signed up for the theater department. I thought, this will be close. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I began acting in college. And uh, then I realized that uh, I had found something I wanted to do even more. Mm -hmm. And uh, but. Um, Obviously, I kept my hand my hand in because I was uh, I was acting in college and I was 
uh, figuring I was going to make a fast buck writing a book on John Garfield. Right. So, uh, and uh, and a fast buck. I I I, I it took me two years to write the book, uh, another couple of years for it to get published, and uh, I um, in the ooh what is it uh, forty five fifty almost forty five years later. Uh, I, I've made a grand total of eleven hundred dollars on that book. <laughs> yeah, so that's uh, that's the question when someone says, "How can I become a film historian?" The first thing I say is, "Don't ever quit your day job." Yeah, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Fortunately, fortunately or unfortunately, I I picked a day job that was was uh, uh, you know just guaranteed success. <laughs> <laughs> well. Uh, I, I think one of the fascinating sto uh, parts of your story is uh, how you came to know and when you came to Hollywood and uh, Hank Warden. And talk a little bit about the Hank Warden story. Well, uh, Hank Warden, I, I, I suspect that a lot of you know who he is, even if you don't necessarily recognize his name. He was uh, a member of John Ford's stock company. He played Old Moe's in The Searchers. All I want is my rocking chair. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, and he was in a uh, hundred something other I think, movies. Uh, we're we're going to show Crime Wave, Crime Wave. Uh, and and you'll see him. I believe he's an airplane superintendent or he, airplane yeah. superintendent in that. Yeah. And uh, I had written Hank a fan letter when I was in high school. Mm -hmm. And he answered it and made the mistake of putting his home address on the envelope. <laughs> <laughs> and so I wrote him again. And he answered that. And this continued for uh, a couple of years. And uh, we ended up becoming kind of pen pals. And then when I was uh, stationed in San Diego in the Marines, uh, one day I got a call and... Uh, it was Hanks asking if I minded if he and his wife drove down to San Diego from L.A. to spend the day with me. And I was in heaven because I was this enormous movie fan. Nobody here, I'm sure, has any sense of what that's like. <laughs> uh, but they came down and spent a wonderful day with me. I, he became, in a lot of ways kind of a, a grandfather to me. And then um, flash forward a few years uh, uh, after his wife passed away, uh, I came out to LA to work on another book and uh, was uh, having a hard time in terms of living quarters. I was living in a fraternity house at USC. During the summer, they would rent out the rooms. They would rent out some of the rooms. The other rooms had a lot of fraternity boys in it. And it was a horrible, horrible place to live. <laughs> and uh, But it was cheap. And uh, I was complaining to Hank on the phone about it one day. And he said, well, why don't you come out here to the house and stay here? I've, I've got this uh, big house with the downstairs that I am, I'm hardly ever in. and." Uh, you can help out around here, and uh, it'll get you out of that joint. And so I went and uh, stayed uh, in Hank's downstairs house for the next four years. I pitched in helping around the house, and I gave him a percentage of whatever income I brought in, probably another $1,100. <laughs> and, uh, and we had a, a, just a wonderful, wonderful friendship. And I got to hear... Uh, a, a lot about, I got to ask him questions and questions and questions about his career. And um, uh, he was not the world's greatest storyteller, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, uh, you, you could ask him about John Ford or Howard Hawks or uh, Raoul Walsh or any of these guys, and he would, he would say, oh yeah, he, he was a really nice fella. He, he knew exactly what he wanted. Mm -hmm. Woody Strode. <laughs> <laughs> the end, <laughs> and uh, but but uh, y if you worked it right, you could pry some great stories out of him. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, he was a lovely man, and uh, uh, and I, um, you know, we were very close friends up until uh, his his death in '92. Mm -hmm. And your own career, how did 
how did that get started? Because, I mean, you, you just said the $1,100 <laughs> and living in heck. But now, you know, when I go down your IMDb credits, it's like in, incredible. What, how did your career as an actor get started, and how have you experienced this, uh, if you permit me, extraordinary uh, accomplishments and staying power? I guess, because you, I mean, you just didn't, this has been a long career already that's still going strong. Yeah, what is the deal with that? Yeah, I know. I, I, <laughs> I, 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 I started acting in college. I did a lot of theater. And then, um, as I mentioned, I came out to, uh, to L.A. in 1983 to, to work on another book. And, um, and I hoped to maybe find some acting work uh, while I was here, but uh, nothing, nothing was happening. But a play I had written um, was produced in L.A. Uh, very successfully, and it got me a big agent, uh, but as a writer. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I started writing television episodes, and uh, uh, and that, I suddenly went from from just, you know, Joe Nobody to not anybody you'd ever hear of, but uh, somebody who had a career. I was actually <laughs> making a living uh, writing various television series. And, um, uh, and then the 1988 writer's strike happened, and uh, um, it changed the way the business dealt with television writers. And... Uh, uh, the freelance market for writers, which is what I mm -hmm. was doing. I didn't want to be a staff writer on shows because it meant I couldn't act. Not that anybody was hiring me to act, but I, I wanted to keep my options open. And uh, after the strike was over, the, the, the bottom fell out of the freelance market. Mm -hmm. But I happened to walk through a door at precisely the right moment to bump into someone who looked at me and said, are you an actor? And I said, well, yeah. And she said, are you represented? And I said, no. Um, and she said, well, you might, be, you might be right for this part in this picture that Norman Jewison is casting. And, uh, and I, I don't even know this person. She's an agent in my, uh, that I met in my literary agent's office and she said do you mind if i send you in uh, no i said no i don't mind and uh <laughs> and uh i went in the next day and met norman jewison for uh a role in a picture he was doing about vietnam vets called end country in the script there was a there was a a, a scene where um it's a movie about vietnam veterans uh, in the years following the war. And uh, there's a scene in the script where uh, one of the veterans is pinning up photos of the different characters in the movie when they were in Vietnam uh, in preparation for a veteran's dance. And uh, I, I, uh, Norman Jewison said, uh, do you have any questions before you read? And I, I said, well, that scene where the the moment where the guy's pinning up the photos on the bulletin board of the guys back when they were in Vietnam. I, is this the sort of thing you had in mind? And I held up a picture of myself in Vietnam, and uh, he just looked at it and said, all right. <laughs> and I read, I guess I read okay, and the next day the agent called me and she said, she said, I am absolutely flabbergasted, but it looks like you may get this, <laughs> which was pretty extraordinary because it was a, a, a major role in a movie starring Bruce Willis, playing essentially his best friend. And I had, uh, I had maybe had one line in a movie in my whole uh, career. So a couple of days later, uh, I got the news that I got it, and this big agency that also represented Bruce uh, signed me as a client and all of a sudden I never made another nickel writing for television <laughs> but I never lost 
a Nichols momentum. Uh, from there on, I just suddenly stopped writing TV and started acting. And uh, I and think didn't didn't Deadwood really boost well, your yeah, career? I, yeah, I, this was this was the late '80s. I'm talking about. Yeah. And now I started acting, right. meaning I started making a little bit of a living. But uh, it was another 15 or uh, so years before anything happened that caught anybody's attention. I see. And uh, uh, I had done a series, uh, a sitcom with Ed Asner called Thunder Alley in the early 90s. But that was as close to real success as I ever got. And that didn't last long. <laughs> and... Um, in 2001, I, uh, my wife Cecily and I had a daughter, and I wasn't making a lot of money, and I thought for the very first time in my career, maybe I gotta do something else. Because it's one thing to sleep on your friend's sofas, it's another thing to ask your two-year-old to do it. And, what, uh, <laughs> what, was, what was the change that really turned, turned everything around? Uh, about two weeks after that, I got Deadwood. And Deadwood changed everything. Um, it was, it was, it was the kind of show that they used to call water cooler shows, where people, you know, it was on the air on Sunday night, and the next day everybody gathered around talking about it. It wasn't quite The Sopranos, but it was in it the was same. Close. It, was it was in close. the same field. It was close. Um, well, I'm talking more about the audience size. Yeah, it right, didn't have right. quite the yeah. same impact on the zeitgeist mm -hmm. but it was it was a hugely award-worthy show mm -hmm. and uh and came in for enormous praise and for the first time in my life i would go into meetings for other projects and people would know who i was <laughs> and uh it was uh it was a shock to yeah. me and uh and since then it's you know, the, the best thing you can do for your career is to get that one great job and not screw it up. And uh, uh, I guess I didn't screw it up because uh, the, they, they just never really stopped hiring me after that. <laughs> and, and, you know, I, great. You know I, I, don't, I don't mean to come across as uh, uh, coy or overly... Uh, or falsely modest, but the business is filled with magnificent actors mm -hmm. who never get a break. And to get one break after another is something that I will spend the rest of my life being grateful for. All right. Is this your favorite John Garfield film? You know, my favorite has shifted over the years. I think probably uh, another film of his that um, has almost certainly been in your festival, uh, The Breaking Point. Yep, uh, yep. That, I, I well, you, you and I are simpatico on that because like sometimes I feel like after I watch Body and Soul just now, I go, that's, that's the best. Yeah. And then if I watch The Breaking Point, I'll change my mind again. Those, those yeah. are his two in my opinion, uh, same things, two best roles. And I had mentioned at the top that uh, this film was a casting call for The Blacklist. Yeah. And uh, 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 in addition to what happened to Garfield, um, which is too long to go into, but he died of a heart attack in 1952 at 39. He was basically put in front of UAC. He refused to name names, and they came up to him, and they went after him, and... Julie said they had the FBI come into her house and the harassment. In fact, uh, Canada Lee, who was in this, was a boxer before he became an actor. Uh, he ended up getting into the federal theater. He played Banquo in John Hausman and Orson Welles' Macbeth and uh, uh, Bigger Thomas in, in Native Son on Broadway. Right. Came to Hollywood, endured Lifeboat, was not treated nicely on that picture at all yeah. uh, particularly by uh, Walter Slezak who was apparently bigoted 
and uh, Garfield and Candle Lee became close, but it's how imitates life. Uh, the whole blood clot thing, Canada Lee could only see in one eye because he had had a detached retina from fighting, and he actually fought Joe Lewis with one eye uh, at one point. The referee mm -hmm. that we saw in the final fight uh, with the wavy hair, kind of handsome, that was John Indrasano, as you know, who probably was involved in coaching every actor in a boxing movie from the early 30s up until the remake of Kid Galahad with Elvis Presley right. in 1962. And he and Canada Lee actually fought. Wow. <laughs> you know? And all of those, like the guy in the pool, the pool room that uh, Garfield slug and then the kid he fought, those were all real boxers. Those were all real boxers. And apparently uh, Julie Garfield thought that, you know, he was a boxer and he was at a party and took one of these guys on and got knocked down. <laughs> uh, but the, the uh, Anne Revere, mm -hmm. Hollywood's mother. Yeah. yeah, only 10 years older than Garfield. 10 years older, made up to look old. Bill Conrad, Bill Conrad was 27 years old when he made <laughs> this movie. And they, they made him up. And apparently he was a little peeved because he had lost some anonymity after The Killers and then this. Because Bill Conrad used to show up at a radio show with that great voice, Marshall Dillon, mm -hmm. read the script, and then go play cribbage or golf for the rest of the day and, and go out and eat. And so he said, movies are just harder work than radio. Yeah. You know, and Bill so Conrad is the only person in the cast of this movie that I ever got to work with. Oh, really? Yeah. What was that? Yeah. What was the Bill Conrad I did, experience like? I did like? the pilot of uh, Jake and the, the Fat, Fat Man. Man. Okay, I remember that. And yeah. Uh, I, yeah. it it it's it's always eaten at me that I let that opportunity go without talking to him about this. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. He uh, uh, is Lou Race here tonight? No, he's not. Lou Race will be here this weekend. Lou Race was uh, the second AD on Canon, mm -hmm. and he said uh, he said I said what was Bill Conrad like? He said well. When you're the star of a hit show and you're the first one on the set at six o'clock in the morning, everyone kind of follows suit. But he said after the first year, Conrad said, I don't want to learn any dialogue. So they used cue cards with him. By that time, he was so heavy, you couldn't tell if he was squinting or not. <laughs> and and uh, even on one shot where they had him walking and they had a guy, the guy holding the boom mic was bald and he had some kind of this dialogue written on his forehead <laughs> that's a true story yeah. but uh you know the cast in this uh, lloyd goff what a reptile i mean he was he was roberts roberts yeah. yeah which is also the name of the producer they did that deliberately did the, they? The, the the original script in uh in um a polanski script it was stevens and everyone was afraid that someone named Stevens was going to sue them for playing a guy like that. So they changed it to Roberts, and they said, they, they said well, if they say anything or someone sues, say we named it after the producer and yeah. so forth. But Lloyd Goff was uh, one of the wheels in the uh, Communist Party USA in Hollywood. And uh, my friend Mickey Knox said uh, he came out of... Uh, Schwab's drugstore with a Life, mag uh, Life magazine about the Renaissance, and uh, you know, Goff says, "What are you doing with that bourgeois magazine?" <laughs> <laughs> you know, he was he was a true believer. I think on his honeymoon, he was organizing tobacco workers at R.J. Reynolds in North yeah. Carolina. He was he was a true believer. But what's interesting is Garfield was not political. It was more Robbie, his wife, right? Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, she was. She had briefly been a member of the communist party in, right. in the early 30s and was uh was very active in in progressive causes oh yeah, and, uh, yeah. uh more so than than uh, uh her husband uh he was he was certainly uh a liberal as he said to huack uh, uh he said uh, I, i'm a i'm a Democrat and a liberal by persuasion, right. and an actor by profession, and uh, but uh, he was never a member of the party, and I don't think he had uh, had that part of his psyche really uh, attuned no. to 
uh, political involvement and political uh, no, he philosophy. Wasn't. He wasn't. But he was. He <laughs> was. Uh, um, I, I think he was a deeply human man. He was, and that led him to associate with people who, uh, in reality or in, in uh, um, appearance, were for the average guy. Right. And who, uh, uh, so I, I, I think it put him in a dangerous position because he certainly did not avoid uh, no, well, those those the, were his those were his friends those and were his, his friends. comrades, and, and, uh, and uh, I think people people tend to forget that uh, in the '30s, a third of the country was out of work. There was no social safety net. Uh, there were there was no workplace safety laws. I mean, there was there was really nothing. And um, Julie told me, Julie Garfield told me, uh, Robbie's best friend for life, her mother, was one of the uh, garment workers that jumped out of the 11th floor in the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire. This was how they grew up. And I noticed they very quickly say, when the social worker scene, they say, you know, religion, Jewish, mm -hmm. and so forth. And, and then the, the Shimon character, yeah. uh, where he said that. And actually, Shimon, I can't remember his last name. He Shimon was Reskin. Also, Shimon Reskin. Yeah, he was blacklisted, too, yeah. along with Art Smith, along with Anne Revere, Along with Lloyd Goff, um, who am I missing here? <laughs> well, you know, uh, Garfield, Robert, uh, the director Robert Rawson, Abe Polanski, the screenwriter, yep. Canada Lee, uh, even yep. down to the bit parts. George Tyne is uh, is yep. one of uh, Garfield's buddies, and and uh, he was blacklisted. It, uh, yeah, uh, uh, Joe Pevney, uh, yeah, Joe Pevney. Yeah, um, I counted ten principal performers or crew people uh, yeah. who were blacklisted. And yeah. you mentioned uh, the Jewishness. Seven of them were, were Jewish. Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting that uh, uh, the two Jewish parents in the movie, Art Smith and Anne Revere, were not played by Jewish people. Yes, that's <laughs> uh, right. That's right. But, uh, uh, and I, I found it interesting on a philosophical level about this. You know, the, 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 the horrible cliche is that that uh, Jews are all about money and everything. And in this movie, the only people who aren't all about money are the Jewish characters. It's <laughs> it's 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 the, the Roberts uh, the, and the, the yeah. Gentiles who are all yeah. you know. And and uh, and and Charlie is the only Jewish character who who falls into that trap and right. that category. Right. Um, it's uh, watching it again. Uh, uh, I saw it again last night in preparation for today, and then watching it again today, it, it's it's um, it's much more than a boxing movie. And it frank, uh, frankly, yeah. for a boxing movie, it's got fairly limited boxing. In yeah, it. yeah. Uh, there's only one real substantial fight. Yeah, the last the last and, scene, uh, which which James Wong Howe used a handheld camera and got on roller skates to film some of those scenes. And yeah. he wanted to do that with a boxing movie Cagney was in when he was at Warner Brothers City for Conquest. Right. But Jack Warner said, we don't use handheld toys here at Warner Brothers. You have to use a regular camera. Yeah. So he had to wait seven years to carry out his notion. And uh, he used the, uh, the Aeroflex uh, camera the, the, that had the right. very portable camera that had been used in a lot of military uh, uh, wartime uh, uh, soldier photographers used, right. which is which is why the fight scenes have this kind of uh, newsreel front lines kind of look right. to them that great that is cutting different too. from the uh, yeah well the yeah. the film was nominated for three Oscars and won one for editing right um, and uh, terrific and this was and this was Garfield's second Oscar nomination right. uh, his first for best actor and uh, um, you know I love Ronald Coleman in uh, okay, a double Kill life a double life yeah and Coleman won the Oscar but uh, it's it's one of those things I think 
I think it was more of a lifetime achievement award. Yeah, yeah. Frankly. I would, yeah, I yeah, would, yeah. I would, I would love for Garfield to have picked up the Oscar for this. Me too, Jim. It's been a pleasure having you here. It's been terrific. Well, Put it together for you. Jim Beaver and John Garfield. Thank you.